So the first speaker you're going to hear from is Janet Salopek. And Janet is the founder of Salopec and Associates. She leads a team of 15 consultants who work across Canada. And they specialize in human resources, strategy, and board governance. Janet has over 20 years of experience, so she brings a wealth of knowledge. She's a senior business leader with a strong background in strategic planning, HR, and board governance. So welcome, Janet. Welcome everybody and I'm happy and pleased to be spending the morning with you and talking to you about retention strategies. So, uh, so welcome and I'm not going to stand at the podium because I, I prefer to, to, to walk around and to, to engage and hopefully the next hour that I spend with you we can have some good conversation as well at our table so we can make sure that we're, we're learning from each other because I think as we come into these uh, workshops and we leave it's always good to network and uh, learn from our colleagues so hopefully we'll have that opportunity over the course of the morning as well. So um, I need my clicker. So I just want to get started and just, I'm going to talk for the first hour on the value proposition. And uh, I, like this, uh, I like this cartoon because it reminds me that the value proposition isn't about one thing. It's not about having one item or one thing in place, whether that's a good comp program or if that's a good orientation program. It's about having a total strategy. And I'm a strategist, so this cartoon speaks to me in that we have to do many, many things. And chaining somebody to a desk isn't one of them. Um, but it's uh, a whole strategy and an approach that we're going to take, and we're going to talk about that over the next hour. Um, one of the things that we have to be reminded is that we, because we often wonder, we're in a recession right now, and here we are spending the morning talking about you know, a retention strategy and, you know, is that actually relevant given the economy that we're facing right now? And I, I just hope, and I'm sure you all realize it is so relevant. Um, if uh, history, if we look back on history in 2007, 2008, uh, surveys were done and uh, a statistic came out that 12% of our high potentials in our uh, organizations at that time coming out of the recession said that they were actively seeking and looking for work. So here we are again, we're in a recession and if we were to, to do the survey again we would be certain and we could be certain that our high potentials are looking, are watching and if they're not um, getting the experience that they want from the places that they work in they will leave us when things turn around. So it is so critical and key that we're talking about re retention strategies today. Um, so what I'd like to focus on over the next hour is just um, how do we define that value proposition and once we define it, what's even more important, how do we walk the talk? So how do we make sure that we're doing what we say we're going to do when we actually spend the time and, and, and call this out, whatever that value proposition might be. And then, <clears throat> what measurements are you putting in your organization to make sure you are walking the talk, to make sure that you are measuring and doing what you say you're going to do, or as leaders you're doing that. And uh, the other thing that I hope that you take away from this session is the idea that one size does not fit all. Many years ago, back in the day, 10 years ago when I first started out my consulting practice, we used to talk a lot about consistency and how important consistency was. It's not that relevant now. It's about making sure that we're paying attention to what our employees need at a particular time. And generationally, we've got four or five generations in our workforce right now. So what does that mean with respect to retaining them? And what does that value proposition look like for the different generations that are in our workforce? So the takeaway being that one size does not fit all, but one even, what you want to make sure you're paying attention to is your high performers, because those are the, the ones that, if you're going to focus, um, the reality is you don't want to lose them. So what's that looking like for them? 
So what is the value proposition? And when we talk about it, and I'm, I'm going to refer it to the employer value proposition, I'm going to talk about the employee value proposition later, but I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the employer value proposition. So what is that? And so what I like to liken it to is really it's your, um, it's your total experience that somebody has as they come to work for you. So it's not one particular thing, it's many things. It is your culture. It is your values. It's how you treat people. It's, a lot, it's, it's, how, it's what you empower them to do when you bring them into the workforce. It is about your compensation. It is about your benefits. It's about everything that touches your employee and what you offer up to them as an employer. That's experience-wise, but also compensation benefits. It's the total package. It's everything. And uh, it's um, what I also like to re remind myself about the employer value proposition. It's l also the branding of your organization. So how many in this room actually have departments or a marketing department that spend a lot of time talking about the brand, your, 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 your company's brand. Okay. So your brand needs to be aligned and consistent with your employer value proposition because it's really the brand that you're offering up to your employees. So what I'd like to suggest is your marketing brand, how you position yourself in the community, needs to be aligned and consistent with your employer value proposition. So the exact same messages that you're saying with respect to your brand in the community should be consistent and aligned with the brand or your employer value proposition. There, there, needs, to be, there needs to be that alignment. I always think though for us, as, um, uh, for my, myself as an HR professional, if I get to work with a company on defining their employer value proposition, I like to be able to work with the marketing department at the same time on their employment brand, right? And understand what that looks like because of that consistency. My greatest and, and probably the best work I ever did around employment and the employer value proposition was when I was invited into an organization and the president said we're developing and we're spending time on defining our brand to the community and at the same time I'd like you to work with on the employer value proposition and I thought he so got it right that's exactly what we need to be doing we need to be doing that together because there's got to be consistency and congruency so I'd like you to keep that in mind as we work the topic for the next hour on the employer value proposition. And the other thing about the employer value proposition, it's your commitment to uh, people that are thinking about coming to work for you and also for the people that are working for you to say, what do we promise to provide you as an employer? What's that experience going to look like? It's that, um, it's that experience and the reason why it's so important to define that experience because you need to help them understand why would they come to work for you as an employer versus someone down the street or across town. So that's why it's really important to spend that time on that value proposition because you want to attract and retain them specific to what's great about your organization. So again, that's the link to the employer value proposition. Um, if we do a good job at defining our employer value proposition and we really get a clear picture on our own minds as leaders, we can communicate that so easily to people that might want to come and work for us. But what's also nice is then we can actually go in and measure it, right? If we're clear on who we are, what we want to be, then we can set up some measures to say, okay, are we doing what we said we were going to do? So I like that about the employer value proposition. And the other thing I like about a well-defined employer value proposition, if you define it properly, as you develop your people programs in your organization, it helps you decide what your priorities are, right? Because you're doing that check back. Does this align with what we said we're going to be doing? Does this align with our values? Does this align with our cultures? Does this align with how we're compensating our people? So it's always that check back. So if you do a good job of defining your value proposition, it makes it so easier to develop the programs that you're going to develop for your people uh, in your organization, and there's going to be that alignment piece.
This statistic, I think, is important, um, and uh, I would just want to talk to it for a little bit. Different surveys show that in 2014, 36% of global employees reported talent shortages, the highest percentage since 2007. And in more recent surveys, so 2015, 73% of the CEOs, the leaders of our organizations, reported being concerned about the availability of our key skills. This, percent, this, this statistic speaks to me because what I know as a professional working in organizations is I want to make sure I understand what keeps the CEO awake at night. This statistic tell, tells me they are concerned about the labor shortages. So as I'm talking to my, the CEO, to the CEOs that we work with, I know then that I'm going to get their attention by talking to them about the value proposition because I know that they're worried uh, about losing their top people. So it gives me confidence that this is important and it also gives me confidence that I can go to the leadership team and say, and this is why we need to be atten paying attention to it. Our leaders pay attention to numbers, so if we can, whatever we do, if we can relate it back to a statistic, to a benchmark, we have a better chance of getting their attention. So this says, says to me, this is important to our CEOs, they want to hear from us, so it is very important for us to figure out this importance of the value proposition and take it back to them and work with our leaders in defining this as part of the strategy. So I want to just put ourselves to work for a little bit. And I want you to think about Starbucks. And I want to th you to think about Starbucks in terms of the value proposition, the employer value proposition. I, a couple of years ago, I was working downtown Calgary and I needed a coffee, a quick coffee, before I went to my meeting. I stopped at Starbucks. I wasn't typically a fan of Starbucks. But Starbucks was there, so I thought, I need to get a coffee. I'm going to go into Starbucks. There was a huge lineup at Starbucks. I was frustrated because I just needed a quick cup of coffee. It took me forever to get served. And I thought, oh, I'm not sure I'm ever going to go back to Starbucks. And then I started doing, when I went back to my office, I was doing some work in value proposition. And I thought, I'm going to look up Starbucks on the internet and just see what is the value proposition at Starbucks. Because I'm just not getting it. It wasn't a good experience for me. What do you think, and I'd like you to talk about it at your tables, what do you think the value proposition is at Starbucks? So just spend a little bit of time. What do you think the value proposition is at Starbucks? So again, thinking in terms of what's the value proposition? It's the messaging they give to people that come and work for them. But it also needs to be consistent with the brand, the messaging that they're giving to the community. So what, when you take a look at Starbucks, you probably haven't worked at Starbucks, but you've probably definitely experienced Starbucks. So what do you think the value proposition is? What do you think the value proposition is at Starbucks? Anybody want to take a chance? There's no wrong answer. We've all experienced it. It's what we experience, really. So what do you think, though? What, what do they publish as their value proposition? What do you think? How about this table? Um, I would say that, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just very, um, that the experience um, that the employees receive matches what their clients or customers would want to get. So we were chatting about spending the entire day there, whether it's chatting with a friend, doing homework, or reading. It's an enjoyable environment. And if you keep going back to the same location, and it's the same staff on the same schedule. They'll remember what you want to order. Definitely. Um, they'll remember what time you come in. If you're running late, they'll notice. That's right. Um, it's about the ready. customer experience. It's about getting to know your, who, who you're, you're working with as far as your customers, about that relationships. It's about that relaxed atmosphere. You yeah. know, you can go grab a coffee and be there for three hours, right? So if you compare yeah. it to, say, somewhere like Tim Hortons, the experience is different, and you're going to be paying more money for their coffee. Um, so for this, I paid at least a dollar more, but right. I still went there today. Right, exactly. As opposed to Tim Hortons, because yeah. it felt good. Right, good. Thank you for that. Thank you. The value proposition, when, now I, I, if, I, they probably evolve their value proposition fairly regularly to make sure they are relevant, but when I looked, this is what the value proposition 
talked about. It talks about retaining and engaging people through um, some of the things that speak to me, rewards and benefits, but, but opportunity for career development. It's about um, management style, work environment and culture. So when that's the promise they make to their people, it's about that work environment, right? They want people in there who are relationship builders, who get to know their customers, who are really into talking about the bean, the experience of growing coffee, about, you know, that whole idea about just finding a connection with their customers. So they will look for people who actually like that relaxed type atmosphere, want to want that connection with their people, want to provide that customer service, and they will encourage their people to live that experience. And so their barristers, or I think that's what they call them, tend to be very relaxed relationship type people, and they are happy doing that, right? So that alignment with the experience that they want to provide for their employees when they're doing their work echoes what they, they, they are offering up to their clients. And for me as a client that day, that experience was not good for me because I wanted a quick cup of coffee. I didn't want to hear about the bean, and I just wanted them to pour me coffee so because I literally had three minutes to get to my, my, my appointment. So that, for me at that particular time, that wasn't the place for me to be, right? So, um, and that's not the promise that they make to their, their clients, and that's not what they expect of their employees, right? They expect their employees to, to provide uh, a more relationship type experience. And that's why they keep their people there too, because that's what their people want. They want that type of environment to work in, right? That re more relaxed type environment. So there's consistency and congruency with respect to their brand and also what they offer up to their, to their, to their people. Starbucks is great for um, learning and development opportunities. They really take you in and they develop you and you develop your people skills, your management skills. It's a great training um, environment for many people who go to Starbucks. That's part of their value proposition and uh, an important part of their culture is that relationship and that work environment. What I'd like you to think about at your table are what are some other organizations that have a strong reputation for their value proposition. What comes to mind and how do, and what is it that those organizations are doing to retain their people through their value proposition? So can you just spend a couple of minutes at your table thinking about, maybe there's an employer here in Medicine Hat, but maybe there's somebody that isn't in Medicine Hat, but Medicine Hat, but still speaks to you as a great employer with a wonderful value proposition, and that's how they're keeping their people. Who comes to mind? Just a couple of minutes at your tables. Okay. Can I ask this table here? <laughs> Did you come up with anybody that you know of when you think of great value propositions and they're known for what they stand for, which is their value proposition, and that's how they attract and retain their people? Anybody come to mind? Or any, any organization come to mind? Mind? I had said WestJet, and then um, she said, no, she hated WestJet, she liked Air Canada, and vice versa, I can't stand Air Canada, <laughs> I'll do anything to avoid flying with them, but. <laughs> okay, so you had thought WestJet, though, and you had thought Air Canada. Okay, what is it about WestJet that you think has a great value proposition? Well, I found every time we've flown with them, we've flown with them from almost one of their inaugural flights is that they were really, uh, they were there friendly, they were went out of their way to help you because one time we have five kids. Flying with five kids can be challenging <laughs> right. and it was pretty seamless. So um, I've enjoyed it and uh, consequently we usually try and book through them. So, so that fun, that sort of, um, they break down barriers, it's also about the relationship. They look after you. So when, from the employee's perspective, what do they experience when they go, or what do you think they experience when they go into WestJet? Because that's the branding that you see, right? Which needs to be consistent with their value proposition. So what do you think their value proposition is to their employees? I think to make it an enjoyable place to be and, you know, your part owner. Your you part know, owner, yeah. And, um, but I, I've heard some differing things from people who work there. You know, you got to be a Kool-Aid drinker, and you better be happy with it. So, <laughs> right. um, you, yeah, yeah. But overall, I mean, I think people appear to enjoy right. working there. 
And that's exactly right. You know, the thing is with WestJet, and I, I, you know, you've got to sort of drink their Kool-Aid sort of thing. Is I think that's what I heard you say, right? The thing, the nice thing about the value proposition is because they know who they want to be. They're outside branding, and it will be interesting to hear your perspective on Air Canada, which we will as well. My experience with WestJet is too. It's fun. I like it. You know, I feel they're quite approachable. It makes my travel experience a little bit more positive, right? So that is their outside branding, and then from the employee's perspective, which is the the, the value proposition they make to their employees, they will look for and they will want to retain people that drink their Kool-Aid. So people that are all about relationship, all are about having fun. And that was who they will focus on as they develop their programs, as they talk to their people, because that's who they want to keep. People that don't drink their Kool-Aid, they really, they can leave, right? they are focused again they know what they want with their employer value proposition so they really focus then on who it is they attract and retain and their progress and processes are for those people sorry i was just going to say did you know that's actually how they were founded is it yeah. was a bunch of pilots and they were paying minimal they were paying in shares right. and my father-in-law was friends with the guy starting it up and they offered him in and he's like i don't want to be a commercial airliner i used to be a snowbird <laughs> it's boring for me and now he's kicking himself <laughs> right right for sure i really do believe they've had it right from the grit from the outset respect to defining their outside brand and then aligning their value proposition and they have done a good job on that but there are people where that's not a good match and they probably should you know leave right because they are focusing on that people that will drink their kool-aid right actually at our last session in red deer somebody was saying that um, they had experience with WestJet where they were rushed, they had kids with them, they had their, their children, young children, and they were obviously flustered, they were about to, you know, not make their flight. And this person from the WestJet team came up to them, helped them get onto the flight, like she said they were wonderful. Guess who it was? It was the pilot. They've got it right with respect to filtering those messaging down, right? And they know who they want to keep on their team, right? I think anyways. But you've had an experience with Air Canada. Yeah. So you've got a value proposition there that you're seeing that you like. I think as well, just hearing you, hearing you um, say about WestJet and everything you described is the exact opposite of what I want when I fly. Oh, interesting. So WestJet is not a good choice for no, you. Yeah. Because I want just organization, calm and quiet, get off the, on the plane, make my journey, get off the plane. I don't need to talk to you. I don't need to be Great. partying. Yeah. I just want to. <laughs> and I usually travel for business. And okay, so they know yeah, we have a business right. account. Yeah. I can get upgrades. I yeah. can be left alone. I can work as I need Air to. Air Canada is your choice. And Air Canada is my choice. Very, very different profile. And what so. do you see from the employees of because that's the outside brand, right? They're that's usually the, the model of see? decorum, organization, yeah, exactly. quietly in the background, meeting your knees. They're not up and down the aisles. That's right. Partying and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so they have aligned, they've done a good job then from your perspective, yeah. aligning the brand, outside brand to the experience that they want their uh, employees to have and also to demonstrate yeah. because they will attract and repaint very organized somebody that doesn't want to tell a whole bunch of jokes and that's who they will they will keep so that is a sign where their alignment from your perspective and your story they've got that good alignment so thank you for sharing that so hopefully through some of these stories we're starting to see the importance of aligning that value proposition with your outside brand and also what employees are experiencing and need to experience and want to experience in order for you as an employer to attract and retain the people that you want. The employer value proposition is really um, a strategy that's not owned by HR. It really needs to be owned by the leaders of the organization. So it's not something that we do as HR professionals in the back room and say, here we are, here's your value proposition, and this is why it's important. It's work that we do with our leaders to define it and then make sure that we're walking the talk. Um, and again, once we've defined the value proposition consistent with our brand, then we need to, as I mentioned before, develop our programs and processes to deliver to that. Um, WestJet, as an example, offers not, you know, they offer, I'm sure, a base pay that's competitive, but it's certainly not 
top quartile, but they offer share programs and things like that because they do want to create that environment where they feel as though they're owners and a pilot would want to help somebody who is struggling to meet their flight, right? So they've created that alignment with respect to their compensation program to create that um, uh, empowerment for their people to build relationships, to be part, to be a big family sort of thing. So there's th that's why that value proposition is so aligned with many of their programs, compensation being one of them. Um, and the other thing, as I mentioned before, the value proposition will allow us to hold ourselves accountable by putting some measures in place. So how do you actually develop a value proposition? So what are the steps? How do we go about doing that? First of all, as I've mentioned, you certainly don't want to do it in isolation. You want to do it with your leaders. You need to educate your leaders as to why this is even important. So if anything you take from this session, take a takeaway that go back and share with your leaders what a value proposition is and why we might as leaders want to start talking about it. Um, you will definitely want to dig out your strategy and your business plan because the value proposition needs to be aligned with that. You need to look out, you need to know what the strategy is, what's the organization trying to do over the next three years, and then engage the leaders in a discussion to say, what's the culture that we need, what are the competencies that we need, what are the values that we need in order to attract and retain the talent to deliver to what we need to be delivering to over the next three years. So that's why that strategy and business plan really, really important. You need to bring some analysis, some data to the, pay, to, to the table. And you need to try to find out why do people join with you? Why do people come and work for you? And why do they stay with you? Because once you've got your definition of your value proposition, you need to then check it to say, is this actually why people come and join us? Is this actually why people stay with us? So it's really important to try to find some data then to support your definition around value proposition. And again, making sure that you're consistent with the branding, uh, the marketing department, what are they saying about your organization? So you need to pull out that piece and understand what they're saying and what they're actually doing relative to that to make sure that you're messaging consistently. What are some of the pieces all around that analysis, that data piece? Why do people come and join us and why do people stay with us? What are you doing in your organizations to get that information? Retention, accidents, interviews. Excellent, yes. Now, you say retention interviews. What does that look like? Stay interviews. Perfect. Perfect. How many in the room are doing exit interviews? Great. How many are doing stay interviews? Okay. A lot, a lot of organizations do stay interviews. Does everybody know what a stay interview is? Yeah, it's basically what it says it's the same as an exit interview but you do it before they actually leave <laughs> so uh, you you might do that you know wh when do you do your stay interviews do them every 18, months. 18 months great thank you okay. <laughs> uh, okay so um, that's perfect I've seen some organizations that do them after three months after six months after a year there's not a wrong or right answer but please do them they're really important in your packages you'll find that there's um, s examples of some exit interviews and what I'd like to suggest is take some of those and turn them into a stay interview, right? You can ask the same types of questions. Make them relevant to your organization, though, and make them relevant to the information that you want to ask relative to your value proposition. So again, the importance of defining that value proposition first and then figuring out, based on our value proposition, what do we want to ask as far as questions go to create that alignment. So start with your value proposition. Yes? How would a stay interview be different from a um, employee engagement survey? Okay. Relatively similar? So the question is, how does a stay interview differ from a uh, engagement survey? And actually, you might ask exactly the same questions. It's just a different process. It's just a different process to get at some of the same outputs. So you can do engagement surveys. How many here do engagement surveys? Perfect, perfect. How often do you do engagement surveys? Every year. Every year? I'm seeing every year. Okay, the great. The thing we find though is when you do the engagement surveys are usually done. Can you start right. again? <laughs> um, the thing we find is the engagement surveys are usually done like with the manager and the departments, um, with HR sitting in. 
The engagement um, survey, okay. Yeah, we do it that way. Okay. But the exit interview is a closed door with the staff member going to the HR manager's office to talk to her. Nobody knows right. what the results are. She collates them, makes a generic response back that goes to the department managers and the board. Okay. So a lot of that is held confidentially and you get different answers because mm -hmm. it's private. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, exit interviews, the best practice is definitely to do it by a third party. So somebody that's not directly related, you're not directly supervising the person because you will get a different, you'll probably get a different perspective. The engagement survey, I, I find that's an interesting process that you, that, that the manager drives that within the department, right? Um, other organizations might do, and that's, that's great. That's a different way to get information, right? Uh, other organizations might do a survey through SurveyMonkey, right? And just put out, like many of, SurveyMonkey is so easy to use now, right? That they will just put some, uh, think about based on what it is they want to learn, put together the questions and throw it out over a, uh, a, a, a SurveyMonkey. Um, all good processes and what you get is data, right? And you get data from different perspectives, which is what you want, right? So all good. I'd like to suggest that you do things in different ways, right? So do engagement surveys, do stay interviews, do exit interviews. It's all data points, right? Data points from different angles, which is always great. So think about different ways you can get input. And again, no wrong way of doing things. It's what's relevant and what works for your people in your organization, and it gives the leaders the information they need in order to make decisions and saying, are we doing what we say we're gonna do? There was one person in, um, I think it was Red Deer, or we were also in Edmonton, uh, had, no, this one was in Red Deer. And she, their organization, does a survey every week, and it works for their organization. I had never heard of somebody surveying every week. Actually, they surveyed twice a week, and they took away one of the questions. They were small surveys that they put out Wednesdays and Fridays, and they took it away on the Friday, and their employees asked for it back. Their employees asked for it back. Why do you think they asked for it back? And yes, and management must have been acting on it. Yeah. Must have been acting on it. Otherwise, why would they have done it, right? And why would they have asked for it back? So again, no right or wrong answers. Make it work. And again, that's that, that whole idea of a one size doesn't fit all. Whatever works for your organization. And, you know, and, and, and listen to the feedback. Listen to what you're hearing and then tweak it or do what you need to do. But all of those are great processes to get the data that you need for your value proposition, right? To say, are we walking the talk? Oh, I'm ahead of myself. <laughs> so just to say, you know, there's lots of ways you can survey your people, get Survey Monkey, we've got stay interviews, we've got exit interviews. We've got a different spin on an engagement survey that I hadn't before, done before where the management speaks to their employees to get that, that sense, of, uh, sense of engagement. All great processes. Um, a trend definitely is a way to don't make it complicated. Keep it simple. SurveyMonkey allows us to do that. Focus groups allows us to do that. So again, don't overcomplicate things when you ask for feedback, but what you always want to do is make sure you're asking the right questions, they are relevant, and you're doing something about it once you get the feedback. Um, I really believe in today's environment, it's really important for us to be real and candid, right? Um, and uh, that's why I like simple is better. And I always feel as though we get a higher level of engagement when we speak to our people at that level. So it sounds like there's some good things already happening in your, your own organization. Our leaders expect us to provide data. Our leaders today expect us to benchmark. So when we go and talk to them as we leave here maybe today about value proposition, 
make sure you're thinking about how do you position that with your leaders so they can hear it and understand it and expect to bring data to the table to say, and how are we doing? Because they will want to see that. So it's really important as we think about value proposition to think in terms of measurement. How are we doing for time, Landis? Well, you've got 15 minutes. Okay, all right. I'd like you to spend a little bit of time um, at your table saying, one of the things that we do when we go into work with an organization on value proposition uh, is that we will bring focus groups together and we will get input to, from them through the focus groups, right? And so these are a couple of questions that we would ask. Um, and we would say, you know, we'd put them into groups and we'd say, how would you complete the following sentences? So what I'd like to do is talk at your group to say, if you were asked these questions about your employer, what would you say? And that will give you a feel for what does that look and feel like if you were to go back to your organization and ask for input. So I'd just like you to try it out at your tables and say, you know, how would you complete the following sentence? The ideal at our company is that every person who works here, how would you finish it? And to be a successful employee at our company, one must. How would, you, how would you answer that? Those are good questions that you might want to take back and ask your people. And again, that will help feed your value proposition. So just a couple of uh, minutes at your table saying, what would that look like? And how would you answer those questions if within your organization? OK, let's just hear from, I'm going to take this table. So as you guys talked about it, when, when you ask the question, the ideal at our company is that every person who works here, how might you finish that? Does anybody want to offer that up for their organization? Pam. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can talk in this. Um, I guess what I was saying is, because I work with um, individuals with disabilities, mostly children, and my company is, at our company, is that every person who works here is working as a team with Perfect. communication because if I'm working with a child and I have to I'm helping them develop with their speech I have to work with the speech therapist I have to work with the other staff and I have to work with the parent so it's not about who's doing it best because we our main goal is to help this child develop I love it I love it so thanks Pam so this is a really good example then so teamwork if you were to ask that is is important you would hope your people would say that in a focus group if you were to ask that. But with respect to your value proposition, it, teamwork is in their organization is going to be part of their value proposition. They're gonna recruit for teamwork and they're gonna keep people who enjoy working as part as a team. Somebody that's very, very independent, who doesn't like to offer up share, work in that team environment, probably isn't gonna be good for your organization and is probably not gonna be a match. So you're not gonna, you know, as far as retention and attraction, uh, retention and attraction strategies, that's not gonna be who you're gonna pay attention to. It's, it's, it's who, who you, you want and need as a team player. Now that's not to mean that you're not gonna attract and retain people that who are independent thinkers, but those independent thinkers need to enjoy that team experience as well. Otherwise they will be frustrated at your organization. I have a lot of independent staff yeah. that work in the community by themselves. Right. Right. And so thinking about what that looks like and getting that right when you do your, re your recruitment and then develop your traction. Perfect example. So somebody else at the table then, how did you, to be a successful employee at our company, one must... We didn't get to that question yet. <laughs> did anybody get to that question? Ah, uh, okay, let's go here then, yeah. So what I said, where I work, I work at an immigration office. So if you're working with immigrants, people from all over the world, you have to have the heart for people. Like you have to love every ethnicity because right. you're going to be working with people from everywhere. Right. Perfect. So again, thank you for that. When you set up your recruitment uh, competencies, when you're trying to figure out who is it we want to keep in those organizations, that's what you're going to target, right? You're going to look for those competencies and you're going to look for programs and processes to support those types of behaviors. So thank you. So hopefully with that exercise, you can see the importance of going back, defining, 
checking with your people, how might we do that through questions like this to gather information, to gather data, all important processes to support your value proposition and to attract and retain your people. Just quickly here, because I, I don't want to run out of time. Uh, again, what are some of the statistics that you're going to bring to the table? Because you will want to do that as you define your value proposition. And again, I'd like you to suggest to that you want to pay attention to your top performers, right? So look for a benchmark on top performers. Look for surveys that will give you information on the top quartile performers. And make sure that you're measuring within your organization who is leaving that you consider to be your top performers. So when you're thinking about putting measures together uh, to support your strategy, to support your value proposition, can you collect data on your top performers uh, with respect to turnover um, and resignations? Um, so survey data. Now, where do you look for survey data? There's some really good survey data for the not-for-profit sector, and there's also really good survey data that you can get from public uh, houses. I just want to ask for the not-for-profit sector, because sometimes that's a little bit harder. Um, are you OK? Do you know where to look to get good data? What are you using? Does anybody, is anybody using survey from the sector, the not-for-profit sector? OK, I'll give you a tip. Um, uh, the Boland survey. So if you're a not-for-profit and you're looking for good um, survey data, benchmarking data, that's compensation but also good information in there that might support your value proposition, look towards the Boland survey. So uh, it's B-O-L-A-N-D survey. And then outside the sector, there's always, you know, there's Winford, there's Mercer, there's, um, uh, uh, sorry, Ace. Ace. <laughs> Hayes, Hayes and other, thanks Landis. All of those are good surveys where you sometimes think, well, that's just compensation. But no, they have got good at bringing in data that will allow you to benchmark aspects of your value proposition because they understand it's not just about compensation. So look to some of those as far as getting good data. Uh, in your, in your um, handouts, you do have some examples of exit questionnaires. Have that as a starting point, though, and, and make it relevant to your organization, right? So, and your value proposition. So, you're making sure you're asking the right questions. But maybe some food for thought in the handout that, um, for, as a starting point, anyways. Uh, we've already talked about the stay interviews. And, you know, take your exit questions that you develop and just spin them so you ask those same questions to people who are actually still employed in your organization. So not a difficult thing to do. <laughs> Align and use processes that are already working for you to get that data from different perspectives. I think we've talked enough about this uh, because, uh, but I just would like to say again, we have up to, up to five generations in our workplace. So one size, of course, doesn't fit all nowadays because we can't be everything to everybody. And that truly is why we want to spend time defining our value proposition because we can't be everything to everybody. First, as leaders, define what's important to you as an organization. Get feedback from your best performers so you know what it takes to attract and retain them. And then find that alignment and make sure you're walking the talk by doing the measurement. Just a quote, people are not and never have been exactly the same. They have different needs, performance levels, personalities, work styles, motivations, and goals. When you honor this reality, you will be more likely to honor each person for who they really are. You cannot lose by being fair. You can, can and will lose a lot by painting everyone the same. And I think that's one of my greatest learnings, because as I said 10 years ago, we did tend to treat everybody by the same. The same. And if we do that today, we're going to lose our best people. So what I'd like you to think about as you leave here, pick one or two ideas that you've gotten from the last hour and move it forward in your organization. You know, even if it's as simple as taking the idea about value proposition and having a conversation with your leaders and sharing it with them. So you can start that dialogue because I said we can't do this alone. We need to find that, uh, we need to find that conversation with our leaders 
and help them understand why the value proposition is so critical and key to attracting and retaining our good people. So thank you for the hour together and hopefully you've found some information that will be helpful for you as you move forward in your organizations.